that's my attitude that as long as it's international conference, we would like to have it in English. Um, and I hope this doesn't make a big problem for, for the listeners. Um, I would like to have like an introductory, introductory lecture on the microbiom health and disease. And you are most welcome for our session on microbiome tomorrow. Um, well, the first question is, uh, what's that uh, microbiome? And uh, that's just a plenty of bugs, bacteria, germs, viruses, and uh, unicellular organisms inhibiting our gut. And that's the estimates is something like 100 trillion. Um, that's my like, own view on the microbiome. And at the biological level, that's a kind of new organ of the human body, uh, especially gut microbiome. And uh, what is special about that is that uh, it is the only organ, since we uh, think of that as an organ, that's uh, probably the only organ in the human body that can dramatically change through human lifetime. Um, why do we study that? Um, actually, that's a hot topic in science and biomedical research. And uh, during last decades, uh, there were, there's like over tens of thousands of publications on microbiome, um, a little bit less on microbiome and nutrition. And uh, we believe now that uh, the topic is microbiome and immunity, because immune system and microbiome um, is really tightly connected. I was really happy a couple of months ago there was a conference in Israel which was actually called Next Generation Immunology where they had like both immunologists and micro microbiomologists meet and connect. Yeah, But there's still a gap between guys studying microbiome and guys studying immunology. There are some good cases where we show that but actually there is so much to open about the connection between immune system and microbiome. Um, I would like to speak a little bit on the history of this uh, issue. Um, and probably one of the most convincing things about the importance of uh, microbiome studies um, was published in the uh, beginning of uh, 2000s. Um, this was just an analysis of types of the diseases which have uh, ceased during the last 50 years and which are uh, gaining importance in the last 50 years. And actually, we could definitely see that uh, since the introduction of uh, antibiotics, for example, we have so much few infectious diseases and the growing amounts of diseases which could be attributed to diseases of immune system. Yeah, and we could thought what could be the connection about that. And actually, the topic we are talking now, uh, microbiome, is quite well explaining that. Yeah, the, the point is that probably killing the bad bugs, the infectious bugs, we also influence the good bacteria in our body. And this actually led to increase of the immune diseases. Um, one of the first and very convincing studies was on the microbiome itself, uh, was done in the United States. Uh, and uh, it was inspired by um, epidemiological state in obesity in the United States. Uh, during 20 years, the level of obese people increased from 10 to 30 percent in some states. And these are not just uh, obese people as you think of them when they walk past by you on the street, but these are actually people with uh, diagnosed obesity. Yeah, and one of the uh, researchers, uh, he actually um, studied the difference between gut microbiome of lean people and obese people, and he definitely showed that uh, with obese people we see very, very specific uh, microbiome composition. Um, then the issue remains, what was the cause of that going to obesity? Um, a lot of uh, fancy researchers on animals actually showed that probably uh, antibiotics that we, we are definitely using a lot, um, are causing that. But at the same time, for example, United States is the country where the, uh, on the contrary to Russia, is uh, the country uh, where the usage of antibiotics is very much regulated. Um, 
And one of the interesting issues, and it's quite easy to understand, is uh, using the antibiotics while we grow cattle. Yeah, for all of the animals now, um, it is very much uh, likely that producers use soup therapeutic concentrations of antibiotics. What it actually does, it probably kills the uh, bacteria in the guts of this uh, cattle and then it starts to weight gain, to weight gain a bit more and uh, for a capitalist that's quite a thing, yeah, you get more out of one animal, yeah, and uh, then these like meat products, they pass on the radars of the regulatory bodies because there is definitely some level of the antibiotics that you cannot really catch with the methods. Yeah, and then this means that uh, people who eat these products, they are constantly under influence of these low dosages of antibiotics. And actually they behave the same as these animals. Finally, they just start to gain weight. Yeah, that's okay, that's not very much scientific, but already an explanation of what's going on. Um, one more thing about uh, us as a global uh, society getting richer is also the studies which are showing that, uh, for example, as the uh, global, as the income in the country per capita is growing, there's also the consumption of meat, empty calories, which include alcohol and sweets, and total calories uh, actually increases. So basically, the more, the more you earn per person, the more you eat. Yeah, and uh, that's a trend for the uh, different economics group, and basically they're all on the same line except some countries like India, which definitely do not eat meat so much. And um, these increase of the calorie intake in some countries, for example in China, led to some dramatic changes. In China, for example, there has never been a selection, a genetic selection for type 2 diabetes, and now they have early onset of the diabetes, that's uh, diabetes type 2, uh, at age around 30, yeah? So they don't have this proper genetics to resist amounts of the calories they have. And one more good example that I always uh, present, that's a Happy Meal project. Um, that's day 137. As you can see, basically, the, uh, the product uh, on the picture and looks more or less the same as you can get it on the day one. Yeah, so this means that uh, it is not spoiled by any germs or fungi, and uh, probably if we eat these kinds of products, uh, which can be stored for a longer time, for sure, that's an uh, extreme example, then they have the same influence on our gut bacteria. So as long as the products cannot be eaten by bacteria on the, when they lie on the table, yeah, uh, this basically means that they cannot be eaten by bacteria inside of us. Yeah, and this, I mean, that's just an example that the um, industry-made products which are being filled with the salts and preservants, they also keep our germs, uh, they keep influencing our microbium. Can we make the next picture? No, it's stuck. Um, yeah, now, uh, 130 days. Huh? You have to wait 130 days. 130 days, yeah. <laughs> uh, probably, um, actually, uh, McDonald's was uh, quite against that uh, study, and uh, they showed that we didn't use any like special chemicals, there was just a high amount of salts. But nevertheless, yeah, I mean, for our microbes, it doesn't matter if this was high amount of salts, or high amounts of, yeah, thank you for the next picture, or high amounts of uh, uh, preservants. Um, there's one more uh, next thing which is really influencing the microbiome, and this picture is well known to Russian listeners. That's Moidadir, um, uh, that's uh, like a cultural event where people were obsessed by hygiene. Yeah, even in Russia we have this tale where the uh, wash basing was chasing the guy who was dirty and trying to wash him all the time. Yeah, and this was needed cultural influence so we could stick from uh, infectious diseases to like a more new clean world. But at the same time, it actually brought us to the world where everything is sterile. 
and uh, there's an observation that the amount of allergies and uh, diseases somehow connected with autoimmunity in European children is growing and after that um, there was this hygiene theory uh, which basically says that our obsession with hygiene brought us to the world where immune system is not trained so much it doesn't when and the in the lifetime of immune system there's a period when we are kids when it's being educated very much and then this gate of opportunity to educate the immune system closes uh, and if during this period child is not uh, doesn't meet so many different uh, possibilities so dif different chemicals like dirt or some dirty food or something yeah then basically uh, immune system stays naive because it's because it never learns to differentiate good from bad that's just a picture to show that even if we, for example, don't eat meat or try to stick to more healthier products, as long as we live in the city environment, we have unlimited chances to meet different chemicals and antibiotics. And that's like a circle of these antibiotics everywhere. They get from growing the cattle, from using the medicines in the hospitals, they get to the sewer system, then they get to the... Um, to the fields and so on and so on. So uh, basically, if you live in the city, there is no chance that you, you, you are never under impact of the chemicals and uh, antibiotics and different pe pesticides. Yeah? So anyway, we are under influence, basically changing our diet from one kind of products to another. We can uh, decrease the amount of influence but we cannot, avoid, we, we cannot avoid it as long as we live in the cities. Uh, several facts about the microbiome which should be very important is the changes of the microbiome through age. And uh, in the first place, it's very important the way of delivery. When there is a cesarean section, basically the first microbes on the child's body is the microbes from the mother's skin. And uh, on the contrary to natural, like vaginal delivery, the, mi the microbes from maternal vagina, they get on the skin and they basically get into the gut of the baby. Um, then, then it really depends on um, if the child is naturally fed or formally fed, because um, this also influences types of microbes uh, which are present in the child's gut. And as you know, um, on the, on the first stages of development of human as a child, uh, most of the tissues are formed, um, like bones are changing very much, uh, and probably as soon as microbiome is so much involved into those processes, the type of the uh, children microbiome is very important. And we can see, for example, uh, that right now the European practitioners, as far as I know, even when the child is delivered through a cesarean section, they actually use the microbes from the mother vagina to just to wash the baby in that, so he has like a proper start for his microbiome. So it's, it's already not something bizarre. Um, then in the early childhood, microbium is changing a lot. When we are grown-ups, microbiome is uh, more or less stable and depends mostly, uh, mostly on what, what we eat. And as we uh, grow old, um, there's like a tendency for microbiome to produce, like uh, to be less and less metabolically active. And we get some of the bacteria as we think these are bacteria needed to digest our body as soon as we die. So the nature is done in the way that when we die, we are being very fastly digested. And I mean, the circle goes on. Um, and it's interesting, for example, you can see some of the examples of companies in Switzerland which switch microbiome for the elderly people uh, and they try to install the microbiome of the young people and they claim that as soon as you get the microbiome from the young person, you get younger yourself. Um, one of the interesting things which I would like just to show is the uh, hypothesis of enteromammary pathway and that's uh, probably um, a nice hypothesis how the bacteria from the mother's guts can get into uh, child guts during the breastfeeding. Yeah? So there is a way that bacteria can be incorporated into the human cell and then 
travel all the way from the maternal gut uh, to the uh, mammary glands, and then with milk it gets into the baby's, uh, baby's gut. Although if uh, the child is not fed uh, uh, naturally, uh, there's also a chance through just the living together, we still exchange microbes. Uh, a little bit on research uh, which are initiated in Russia. I was uh, happy to be part of them. Uh, one, of the, one of the works published in 2013 was about the major research of the healthy population in Russia. And basically, the uh, conclusions that we got um, was about comparing rural and uh, po po population of rural areas and population of the major cities. Um, what we saw was surprise that uh, uh, like microbiome of the inhabitants of the cities was very much like that of the major cities in United States or Europe. Yeah, we compared those several studies. And microbiome of uh, population in the villages was quite different. And, uh, well, what we discussed in the paper was actually the globalization of the microbiome and it's probably due to the fact that in every shop, in every city, we buy more or less the same food, more or less the same global companies are presented everywhere, and this uh, industrial food serves as a filter which makes more or less, uh, which makes a global microbiome, yeah? which is very much alike in every, uh, alike in every city. Uh, however, in uh, smaller villages, which have some ethnic specificities in uh, food, or, or the way uh, people cook something or whatever shows that uh, the, micro the microbiome compositions there are very distinct to the area where, where you get it and it's more or less the same among the inhabitants of the same uh, village, for example. Uh, yeah, let's turn back to the um, definition of the microbiome and I would like to say a few words about the genome variation. Yeah, what does it mean, uh, genome variation for the microbiome? This means that uh, different bacteria, they change in abundance, and then we see that there is a genetic variation. And there's one more type of variation, like a gene variation, that's in one tiny bacteria, it, there's a possibility to mutate, yeah, and to change one gene to another, or to adopt novel gene. Um, what is good, that basically we are trying to use it as a marker, and uh, Definitely, we are now trying to use it as a drug, yeah, to introduce new genes, to introduce new bacteria, and use it as a drug. Uh, for example, and it's very well known that um, for some of the diseases, we have disease-specific taxonomic composition, and this is the data from the uh, Crohn disease research, and we see these guys in red, and that one especially with acute Crohn disease over there, they are very much different from the from the major, point, major amount of the blue dots, which are normal. Yeah, and um, these are mainly some of the bacterial species um, which are normally present in a high amounts when you have uh, this type of the disease. Other thing which is uh, interesting is the, for example, possibility of bacteria to detoxify the medium. We were comparing like populations of United States, Europe, Russia, and China, and we saw that in Chinese population, uh, there's a high amount of genes which could, for example, detoxify uh, high, um, heavy, heavy metals yeah? and uh, bring them into less toxic form. Yeah? And it was quite obvious, as soon as they have a lot of industry, industry in China, the impact of the heavy metal on human health is very high, and then bacteria try to save themselves and probably the human they live in from, from this uh, influence. And at the same time, uh, we found some of the genes which are more prevalent in the United States population, and these were genes which are actually working with some of the components of the foiler or <laughs> components of the preservatives of the food. So as soon as they probably produce more industrial food in uh, United States, which is being packed and preserved for a longer time, bacteria also know that and they are trying to save themselves from that. And we can actually use this as a marker of toxicity and at the same time we can use these enzymes which are bacteria using, a, which are bacteria already using to help to detoxify the medium already in the gut. 
Um, very important topic uh, lately has been food intolerance. And um, well, it's interesting that we, when we started to look into food intolerance and we took uh, lactose intolerance as an example, that there is nothing clear that uh, in the, everything is so much vogue over there. Uh, there's no clarity between the doctors. Like the main thing, if you have the lactose intolerance, the major advice from the doctor is to avoid drinking milk and using direct products. But um, there is no, like, I mean, most of the lactose intolerance cases have been associated with the human genetic variation, yeah? And it's just for humans, it was not natural to digest lactose all through, light, all through the lifetime, only in the childhood. But then it appeared that even for humans who have specific genetic predisposi predisposition for uh, digesting lactose, there could be the cases where they are at the same time lactose intolerant. Yeah? And then it appeared that it very much depends on the bacteria that you have, where, they, where they're like your gut is bloating after you, uh, have the, after you intake milk or diet products or not. And finally, there is a, like an open question that sometimes in case of the lactose intolerance, you have the response from the immune system and sometimes you have no response from the immune system. Yeah? So immune system decides for itself if it should react to amount of lactose which has not been digested neither by host nor by bacteria. And probably we have similar situation, we can have similar situation for any type of the foods. Um, although it's not so obvious as with milk, because milk is very much, very, very much used. And I know that, uh, for example, in Israel, they recently showed that uh, there was a lady intolerant to, um, how you call that? Uh, she was intolerant to, let me think, pomidor? Tomato, yeah, she was, she was intolerant to tomato she was eating and she never knew that, but they showed that with the profound testing that they were doing that there is a level of intolerance for tomato. Who could think of that? Uh, yeah, what, what we are doing also is we are trying to analyze the whole scope of the papers on the microbiome. And right now we have something like over 15,000 papers published on the connection of the uh, microbes and diseases. And it's quite interesting that here we depict the diseases which, which were associated with the similar bacteria. We depict them together, like closer together. And it's interesting, as we say, as they wire together, they can fire together. And yeah, that's more or less in large picture. In large picture. And you can see that here we have like liver cirrhosis, colitis, okay, that's about the digestive tract diarrhea more or less, uh, but also we have this cystic fibrosis over here, yeah, which is somehow connected on the bacterial level with all of these diseases, or asthma, for example. Yeah, it's close to cystic fibrosis, but it's also close. And then we have this Alzheimer's disease, yeah, which is really interesting. We are, we are going more and more deeper into that, but already uh, there are connections between different diseases, and that's probably immune system, which reacts on the same bacteria similarly, and then it can produce either this disease or that. Yeah, as we go further, that's just a picture to show that there is a high influence, high impact on the microbiome from the drugs that we take, from the food, from the cattle being born, from our lifestyle, from the environment and soil itself. Uh, yeah, a few words about the microbiome studies outside the gut, and these are just examples. For example, this is very, very famous, at least as, as I believe, um, a company in the United States, Aobiome. What they do is they actually already sell the sprays with bacteria, and you can put them on the skin. And these bacteria, they digest uh, your sweat. And you, at, after some time of using that, you actually stop smelling. Yeah, the only thing you have to do is to avoid using the soap or different uh, washing materials. When, when you wash, just use the water uh, for a while. And this allows your skin to be inhabited by different beneficial bacteria. And that's probably how our skin was looking like 200 years ago. But more importantly, that's um, except for fun, they also have some medical results. Because actually, skin gets better. 
And now they are proposing to treat like acne, eczema, um, and different diseases of skin with uh, these bacteria which should be living on, on, on the skin of the patient. Uh, yeah, and that's the guy over here, he hasn't washed himself for 15 years and they say you can still tolerate him. Um, yeah, one of the interesting initiatives which is uh, also coming to Moscow now is the uh, microbium of the uh, different areas in the city and that's the microbium of the, uh, the underground stations. Um, there was a, a good uh, study published in the United States about the um, New York uh, underground and now they are inviting all major cities, all major cities of the world, like 43 cities, to contribute to that and also make this microbiome of the cities visible. What, what will this allow us to do is to think on how people actually exchange microbes and probably the underground stations are the places where people exchange microbes the most and now Moscow is also part of that uh, uh, major effort to and I think so far that's that's the probably the biggest effort to describe the microbiome of any of any area uh, there are some companies on the market uh, which are already uh, allowing you to to make this microbiome analysis um, these are two most famous probably in the United States, that's the Ubiome and American Guts. Um, mostly they uh, take your analysis, they sequence uh, the bacteria, for example from feces, and then they give you out the amount of these or that bacteria which you have and you should go yourself with interpretation of that. With American Gut they also show probably to which kind of the diet you are closer. If there are some participants from, from that study present here, thank you for participation. We got 250 people and uh, this was like before and after the healthy diet which was uh, introduced to participants. The results should have been presented in the conference but uh, basically we're sorry for that. It's a little bit delayed but I'll show you some preliminary results that we have according to the questionnaire. Can we get, uh, I can do it myself. Yeah, what is also interesting that people in the study were very active and very honest and uh, this allowed us already to think of some ideas about uh, the way that they eat and here we have the products according to the questionnaire which are being eaten together. Yeah, and that's quite interesting that people who normally drink, they, it's either they drink or don't drink at all. People who eat, eat meat, like they also eat uh, a lot of chicken, like sausages, bread and uh, potato. And there's the other cohort of people who eat a lot of vegetables excluding potato. Eggs are somewhere closer to meat. But the most interesting thing that uh, we have the guys who are like, it's either they are drinking wine and they also eat spinach, for example. Yeah? So, uh, it is still that those vegetarian guys are a little bit guilty. Yeah? They, drink a little bit of wine and this already characterizes the population like the, the normal population of the cities although there are mostly friends and families uh, of ours but I hope that at least 50% of that was just people who wanted to know more about the, the, their microbiome. Um, following up after this uh, research um, what we are going to do is uh, together with the uh, Atlas Biomed Group. Uh, we are going to launch this test for uh, for for uh, for anyone who wants to participate, yeah, who wants to do the analysis. And uh, the final idea is to come up with the recommendations for the dietary changes, dietary interventions, which would allow you to stay healthier and to lessen the risks of the diseases. I have one question to start with. So uh, I really like your slide about uh, like dead meat in McDonald's, nothing lived there. But uh, have anybody tried to compare, let's say, Mediterranean uh, diet to um, vegan diet to vegetarian and uh, the differences in microbiome? Mm. Yeah, there are, I mean, the topic is interesting that uh, there are associations between uh, the diet and microbiome, but um, it's like... Mm, the microbiome composition that's basically influenced by so many factors and diet 
is probably not the one of the, not, 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 not the main of them. As far as I know, there's a good study on the Lifelines cohort uh, from Groningen, uh, Netherlands, where they have very well described cohort, uh, phenotypically described people with all kinds of like genetics, food habits, and so on. And, and they did the microbiome, for over, microbiome analysis for over 100 people, and they show there that some of the dietary habits actually influencing the, the microbiome, but it's like not always in the first row. Uh, thank you. Uh, you. You said that microbiome uh, train the immune system. How how does it happen? Uh, how microbes uh, are transported there? How uh, how they survive? I won't uh, spoil uh, one of the next papers uh, for tomorrow. I'll just uh, say a few words of immune system повсюду и насколько мы знаем больше I know more than 50% of immunoglobulins are concentrated in the guts and you can see how they are all around those bacteria and we imagine guts as a huge computer which all the time uh, digest bacteria which are nearby and there are many ways how this bacteria uh, may our uh, parts of the bacteria can come into it and uh, guts uh, react to the bacteria and digest them and they also uh, give some elements or which uh, cause certain reactions in the body. Our system can distinguish between uh, bacteria from our body and up from outside of our body and this mechanism is important because from childhood we know our own uh, microbes uh, and uh, we know that something that came from outside should should not stay forever and uh, if for example uh, if the child survived, uh, his immune system remembered his own bacteria and knows them. That's one of the uh, reasons why uh, having bacteria from other people, uh, probiotic components may work, not in the ideal way. Because, uh, for example, yogurt bacteria are very useful, but uh, they will disappear from uh, the body because our immune system knows that uh, these bacteria is not ours. So uh, if uh, the mother eats yogurt when she's pregnant, probably his immune system uh, will know uh, and recognize yogurt bacteria as his own. But uh, it's, uh, it's actually not proved yet. It's First of all, you said that uh, the microbiome is quite stable in an, in an adult. Uh, and then you say, okay, if we change our food, then the microbiome will change. So how stable is it really? And the second question, is there some sort of reference microbiome when you test a person and then you say, okay, fine, you, you should just keep eating what you're eating and do what you do, or you suggest dietary changes to everybody? Mm -hmm. uh, there are two parts of the question. Um, if, it's, if it's stable, I mean, it is stable because we are stable in our habits. Yeah, I mean, people rarely change their dietary habits, dietary habits, uh, over and over. Um, basically, we eat differently through the seasons of the year, and this is maybe the microbiome should be changing correspondingly. Yeah, but uh, in in our, for example, in in the case of the crowdfunding study that we made. We, for the most of the people, the changes in the eating habits were like dramatical. Yeah, we we invited them to dramatically uh, change their dietary habits for the better. Yeah, and I mean we don't know the results yet, but our hypothesis would be that we managed to show them that microbiome is changing accordingly, and that would probably like make them eat like better. Yeah, and some of the things were like having this many many water a day or like uh, having a shorter periods uh, sh shorter intervals sorry uh, between the between the food yeah, and and it's not all the people do it's it's not that most of the people do even those people who eat the healthy products what was the second part i always forget when it's two parts 
Uh -huh, yeah, there, there is no reference biome, and that's, and that's the problem for the Western medicine. I think that this topic was already touched, that basically we know what is a disease, yeah, but we don't know what is health. Yeah, we can take the normal, yeah, but it's just the average between everyone, yeah, and probably there is no, like, reference, there is no, unite, like, single reference. That's why we go for the personalized medicine. Yeah, right now in the microbiome studies, they have really good examples, yeah, and I hope this will be for, also for, it's a spoiler for to, to, tomorrow's speaker. Yeah, there are examples when we can make the diet more personalized and find the best composition personally for that very uh, patient or like participant of the study. Мы не использовали никакие показатели микробиоты для того, чтобы составить рацион. Uh, to make these recommendations for your participants, uh, well, we uh, have very good dietologist, and uh, you will be able to uh, ask him questions. Uh, who well, we mostly uh, thought about general recommendations uh, that are good for the majority of people. We had simple questionnaire, and uh, mostly. Uh, why did you want to do macrobiotic analysis if you just gave general recommendations after that? Well, we did not claim that we were going to give uh, individual recommendations, but we wanted to investigate how these general recommendations, guidelines, if uh, you keep um, uh, uh, you stick to them during two weeks, how uh, macrobiotics uh, is going to change, because our hi uh, hypothesis is that uh, there will be great changes, and then we'll be able to work with this data. And as in, em in every scientific research, we need uh, to see the results first. I will ask question in uh, Russian. I'm not very sure in the terminology. Uh, we. Uh, uh, analyze faeces, right? I have a question. How uh, this analysis uh, in, f in the faeces uh, reflect uh, the real composition of macro macrobiotic? Because uh, we have uh, different uh, bacteria in all our guts, and they don't necessarily get into our faeces. Uh, and uh, then they won't be reflected in the analysis, the, in the test that you take. Uh, so how um, probably uh, you uh, make recommendations in accordance with these uh, tests, but uh, they are inadequate because uh, the majority of guts are not represented. Yes, I was expecting uh, this question, uh, and uh, it's very natural, yes, when we imagine how our guts are composed, we understand that there are different compartments, and probably uh, what will uh, take for analysis, it will be from distal part of the guts, but it doesn't matter, because we look at all people for these tests, both healthy people and sick people, and uh, we have certain reference uh, uh, macrobiotic uh, in thesis is uh, a reference uh, and uh, we can see uh, whether our person, our subject is closer to healthy or uh, non-healthy specimen. Of course, we realize that in other compartments it can be different, and of course uh, we can't see certain macrobiotic elements, but we use uh, those technological possibilities that we have at the moment, and uh, so things that, we, that are not available for us can't be used, but we hope. But uh, m maybe, uh, maybe we look at feces, but we do not see actual uh, problem, and uh, maybe we sort of miss our target. Yes, uh, you're right, and I think for, for the probably the last 200 years, uh, 300 years, medicine only looks for things under the light, and it uh, does what it can do. Of course, as researchers, we would like to know everything, we would like to know all the uh, causation, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's not helping, because uh, we can't... Um, uh, we have uh, available what we have available, and uh, it's probably enough for early diagnostics.